to Matthew 15 and verse 29. We're going to cover the last verses here, 29 to, 20, 29 to 39 this morning. And let's first of all, let's first of all look to the Lord in prayer. Father, you are such a great God, Mikhail, who is like you, God. And so we pray that uh, you would uh, open our eyes that we might admire you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Matthew chapter 15, verse 29. 15, 29, Matthew. Jesus departed from thence and came nigh unto the Sea of Galilee and went up into a mountain and sat down there. Great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, many others, cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. Insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to be made whole, the lame to walk, the blind to see, and they glorified the God of Israel. Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude, because they continue with me now three days, they have nothing to eat. I will not send them away fasting, lest they faint in the way. His disciples say unto him, When should we have so much bread in the wilderness as to fill so great a multitude? Jesus saith unto them, How many loaves have you? They said, Seven, a few little fishes. He commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. He took the seven loaves. And the fishes gave thanks, break them, gave to his disciples, disciples to the multitude. They did all eat and were filled, and they took up the broken meat that was left, seven baskets full. And they that did eat were 4,000 men beside women and children. And he sent away the multitude and took ship and came into the coast of Magdala. Okay, so we come now to this verse here in, in verse 29. It looks like a verse that's a, not earth shattering. It says here, he departed thence. And, and from thence it came into came nigh into the Sea of Galilee. I mean, on the surface, it just looks like a, a little detail of the geography. It's, 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 it's helping us to, to understand that we knew that he was uh, over there. He's coming back to the Sea of Galilee. But that statement, it causes us to look at this chapter and just, just once again, remind ourselves, where was he that he came back to Galilee? And so we look up at verse 21, and it says that he was in the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Sidon. And, and then we understand that, oh yeah, he had been in Galilee, and he left Galilee, and he went over to the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And that information now in verse 29, it makes it very important for us because it emphasizes that the Lord had taken this side trip. This side trip. It's very important to him because it, it tells us that, yeah, he was in Galilee, he left Galilee, and he went over here to Tyre. So now he's coming back. It's a very important uh, verse here because it draws out questions. Where did he go? And, and when he left Galilee on this side trip, and, and what did he do when he, when he left Galilee on this side trip? And, and, and what was the reason why he left Galilee on this side trip? Now, we can get all these answers, these questions out of this chapter because... First, we, we know where he, we, we know uh, when he left Galilee that, that he went over to the Mediterranean. He went over to the, the coast of the Mediterranean Sea in this place called Tyre and Sidon. And, and second, we know what he did there. We just saw that before, that, that he had the meeting. Oh, yeah, he had the meeting with this Gentile, this, this Canaanite woman that he met there. And when we look through all the Gospels, we see that that's the only record of what he did there. He, he took this side trip from, from Galilee. He, he had this encounter with this Gentile woman who had a daughter that was tormented by, 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 by the devil, by Satan. And, 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 and that was it. That was it. And, 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 and in fact, we, as we saw last time, his first words to the distraught mother was he called her a dog in, in, in verse 16. He answered and said, it's not me to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. We look, and we look there and said, what? That was it? That's why he left Galilee? So that he could go to a Gentile woman and, 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 and call her a dog because she wasn't Jewish? And, and, and that was the start of this encounter with her. A very important encounter that ended with the Lord not only doing what she wanted him to do, which was to heal the daughter, but he then crowned her with the highest title 
given to men great faith. Great faith, he says in verse 28. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. That was the reason. That was the only reason why the Lord took this side trip, traveling all the way from Galilee to the, coast, to, to, to the Mediterranean there. It was for that woman so that he could accomplish three goals with that woman. First of all, he built her faith. He built it up. Second of all, he did heal her daughter, which was her immediate request. And third, he, he rewarded her with this tremendous title, great faith. Like he said to, to another Gentile, I haven't found that within Israel, to a Roman centurion. And, and she takes this place among, among this, this elite group, so to speak, who have great faith. That's why he took the side trip. And, and just for that woman, just for that woman's daughter, and and, and that woman, we can imagine her now in heaven, and she knows so much now that she didn't know then that, that, that he took the time, that he took all this time and she's meditating on this fact now, and she's saying to herself in heaven, he came all the way from the Sea of Galilee to the Mediterranean coast just for me, just for me. He left his own Jewish people just for me. A lowly Gentile. I'm so important to him that he would leave Galilee, leave those pressing responsibilities. I mean, we're going to find in a minute that when he goes back, multitudes are going to flock to him. As if the multitudes during this time that he was gone were saying, where is he? He left. Well, when's he coming back? I don't know. And they were so eager for him. They had so much they wanted him to heal this person and that person, and they couldn't get enough of him, and they and, and we're going to see that later on, and they, they, they end up spending three days, they didn't have to, later on we're going to see that, they spent three days with him up on the mountain, forget about food, just want to be with him, so much desire, but he left it all, and this woman now in heaven is saying, he left it all just for me, just for me, does he see, the, the woman, does, does he see so much worth in me? To do all that for me, a Canaanite woman is now in heaven asking those questions. She can't get over it. She can't get over it. She can't get over it all. That 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 he who had said earlier in verse 24, in verse 24, and he answered and said, I'm not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He had told his disciples. In Matthew 10, 5, Matthew 10, 5, these 12, Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, nor into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. And she would say, she would say to him, it, it, she would think to him and say, You were specifically sent to the Jewish people. You told your disciples not to go into a Gentile area like the one I lived in. And yet you left your commission to go to the Jewish people, and you did that for me. And you did that, you did what you told your disciples not to do. You came to a Gentile area, you did that for me. Am I so important to you that you came so much out of your way to find me? Did you do, really do that just for me? And, if, and, and, if, and we can imagine if the Lord responded to those questions, he would say to that Gentile woman, yes, I did. Yes, I did, I left the area of my commission to find you. I did what I told my disciples not to do in order to find you. I did it, and I would do it again because you are just that important to me. And, 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 and as that woman there is it, 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 kind of lost, like the hymn says, in a, in a, in a, in a state of, uh, of wonder, lost in wonder, yeah, for what the Lord, Lord Jesus did to her, we can imagine the Lord Jesus Responding to her with the words of Matthew 18, 12. Matthew 18, 12. How think ye? If a man have a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, does he not leave the ninety and nine that go and go into the mountains and seek at that which has gone astray? And if so be that he finds it, verily I say unto you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the ninety and nine that didn't did go astray. So when Jesus says that so Jesus, in essence, would be saying to her, you were that one sheep 
out of, out of the hundred that went astray. And I left the ninety and nine back in Galilee to seek you. It's so interesting that the Lord starts off that 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 the, the, the discourse there about the about the ninety and nine in Matthew eighteen twelve when he says, "How think? How think you?" In other words, he says, "What do you think?" What do you think? What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep, one of them wanders off, do you really think that he'll just say, oh, I still got 90 and 9. Who cares about the council? Okay, I got 90 and 9. No. Put it another way. If a woman has 11 children, one of them gets cancer, you think she's really going to say, well, I got, I got 10 healthy ones, so why should I spend all my time with this? I can tell you from my daughter-in-law. Doesn't have that way. Woman doesn't say, I'm not going to go all these chemotherapy, let them die. Not at all. If that one child gets cancer, that child becomes her most important child. And in the same way for the shepherd, that one lost sheep that, that, that becomes the most important sheep, a sheep that he thinks about all the time, a sheep that he imagines is crying out, like, in, in, like, like the Lord spoke about in, in Ezekiel 34.11. Ezekiel 34.11. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered. So will I sheep, seek out my sheep and I will deliver them out of the places where they have scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And he would say to that woman, you were the one sheep that was scattered in the cloudy and the dark day, and I searched for you. I came all the way out here until I found you, and I brought you to myself. And those questions, the Canaanite woman, this asking, you left your Jewish people in Galilee to search for me, is the same question that you and I ask as well when we read Philippians 2.5. Philippians 2.5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, made in the likeness of men, being humbled, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And we're just like that woman. We look at Philippians 2 and we say, really? Really? Did you really leave heaven? Did you really come down from heaven just for me? Did you really leave all the comforts of your divine kingship and, and everybody waiting on you and on your every desire? Did you you had everybody serving you and you, you did that for you became you came down, you became a lowly human servant just for me? You gave your life, you tasted death for me, the most horrible, torturous death. And, and, am I that important to you? And 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 and, and then the song puts it so well. He left the splendor of heaven, knowing his destiny was the lonely hill of Golgotha, there to lay down his life for me. If that isn't love, then the ocean's dry, there's no stars in the sky, the sparrow can't fly. If that isn't love, then heaven's a myth. There's no feeling like this if that isn't love. And that's, that's in essence what the Lord told this Gentile woman. So he would tell us, yes, I did it for you. Yes, I did it for you, and I do it a thousand times again, because the simple truth is, you're just that important to you, to me. And my love is inexhaustible because of Jeremiah 31.3. Jeremiah 31.3. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindnesses uh, have I drawn thee. So this trip to Tyre and Sidon that's referred to here and that he came back from in, in verse 21, it just shows us characteristics of the heart of the Lord Jesus. It, it shows from this trip that his intentional response, to, to the, he, he heard, he saw the heart of this dear woman. He heard her cry long before she verbally said in, in verse 25, Lord, verse 25, Lord, help me. And, and second, we see the Lord Jesus says, he's colorblind. He's colorblind. He's nation blind. When it comes to souls, uh, Romans 2.11, Romans 2.11, for there's no respect of, God, of persons with God. No respect of persons with God. Galatians 3.28, Galatians 3.28, there's neither Jew, there's no such thing as Jew or Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, all are one in Christ Jesus, all are one in Christ Jesus. And second, we see how the Lord Jesus went to great lengths 
great lengths to reach out to someone who was reaching out to him. Like, like the hymn says, the hymn puts it so well, none of the ransom ever knew how deep were the waters crossed, nor how dark was the night the Lord passed through before he found the sheep that was lost. Out in the desert he heard its cry, t'was sick and helpless and ready to die. Lord, Lord, whence are those blood drops all the way that mark out the mountain's track? They were shed for one who had gone astray. Before the shepherd could bring him back, Lord, where, where, where did those, whence are thy hands so rent and torn? They're pierced tonight by many a thorn. thorn. And all through the mountains, thunder riven, and up from the rocky steep, there arose a glad cry to the gate of heaven. Rejoice, I found my sheep. That's what he did there in, in Tyre and Sidon. He found a sheep. Canaanite woman. Okay, so now, we're tracing the Lord. He's coming back to Galilee from Tyre and Sidon. And now we read that what, what he does when he comes back in verse 29, says, well, verse 29, it says, he went up into a mountain and sat down there. Sat down. You know, I never see this. The Lord, you don't see very often the Lord sitting down. But you do see the Lord sitting down. But you just can't help but think of Psalm 110. Psalm 110, quoted several times in the, in the New Testament. So, Psalm 110, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. He's God the Father. He's talking to the Lord Jesus. He's telling him, come sit down. Your enemies are going to be made your footstool. There's a place for you, the highest power. And now the Lord Jesus is sitting. He's not sitting on that type of throne right now of the highest power. He's sitting on a mountain. Everyone can see him. Anyone who wants to can come to him. And, 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 and now that, that it's known that he's come back into Galilee, they're flocking in verse 30. Verse 30, great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. It just doesn't take long. It doesn't take long at all for the word to spread. He's come back. He's returned. And the crowds are now flocking. The, 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 evidently, there were so many people that they knew he was gone when he went over there tired and saw done. And, 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 and they wanted to come to him, but they couldn't during that time. And so now he's back. And so they're coming, and they've got in the scene. They're bringing all these people, probably every person they can find that's sick or, or, or has some disability. And, and, and they're just flocking to him, multitudes, like waves. And, and seeing that scene. We can see in that scene, we can understand the, the, the deathbed prophecy that Jacob gave, one of his few, one of his, he only had a few last words in, in Genesis 30, 49, and one of them was about this type of scene, and when he was talking about Judah in Genesis 49.10, Genesis 49.10, when Jacob said, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. And you see all these people, they're gathering together, and you can just see this sight, and that they, 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 all this, he's back. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna knocking on doors. People are knocking on doors, sick people's doors, disabled people's doors. Hey, he's back. I'm going to take you to him. This is going to be your day of healing. And, and, and they're on the way, and, 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 you, and you stop them. If you stop them, you say, where are you going with that crippled person? Where are you going with that blind person? Where are you going with that, that person who can't speak? And they say, I'm going to Jesus. I'm taking him to be healed. He will be healed. And as they're flocking to him in verse 30, and, 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 unto him shall the gathering of the people be. And, 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 and it's interesting that in verse 30, we've got like a list here. Looks like a hospital list. There's all the patients that are in the hospital here. And we, we, you know, it, it says they're lame, they're blind, they're dumb, they're maimed, and many others. And, 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 and it's like uh, uh, and all the sick and disabled there. And it's such a detailed list. And, and, and you say, wow, that's kind of a long list there. And many others probably could have made a, they could have made a longer list. But, and so you say, you, you kind of stand back and you say, what? What is all that? What, 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 what's all that lame, mean, blind, dumb, 
many others. And when you look at it, you just say, you have to say, oh, oh that's what sin has done in the world. That's what it Sin caused a person to be lame. Sin caused a person to be blind. Sin caused a person to be mute. Sin caused a person to be disfigured. And then the words, many others. And, and we can add to the list. We can add cancer, leukemia, coronary artery disease, diabetes, and the list goes on and on. And, and all of those problems were not part of God's original plan in the creation, but sin did it. Sin damaged. Sin damaged it. And, 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 and that was the reason why the disciples, when they saw a man that was born blind, they understood sin caused that. Sin caused that. And so they asked the Lord the question in John 9, 2. John 9, 2. His disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Because of sin. Sin that destroys the body. Sin sets the body in those various states. Like, like my friend Barry recently, he, he wrote me, and he was telling me that, you know, he, he said, he said, Tom, I need a shoulder replacement, I need a hip replacement, I need a knee replacement, and I need an ankle replacement. So I called him, I said, Barry, what's going on? He says, the warranty's up. <laughs> Actually, the warranty's up at our birth. It's up at our birth because Psalm 51.5, Psalm 51.5 says, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And, and so we have all these people here with all these different problems caused by one reason, sin, and, and they're all being they're all they're, they're all being brought to one person. And he's not an orthopedic surgeon, he's not an eye doctor, he's not a neurologist, he's not an oncologist, he's not a cardiologist or any other specialty. They're all being brought to the Lord Jesus because no matter what the physical problem is, it's all caused by sin, and there's only one person alone who can take sin away, who can cure sin. And that's why the Lord Jesus is described in Hebrews 9.26. Hebrews 9.26, in the end of the world, he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And John 1.29, John 29, when, Jesus, when John saw Jesus coming to him, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And in 1 John 3.5, 1 John 3.5, he was manifested to take away our sins. 1 John 3, 8, 1 John 3, 8, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And you read those, and what we're reading about here in Matthew 15 are the works of the devil. That's the list. The individual physical problems in verse 30 are the works of the devil. They're the individual works of the devil. And he alone is the solution to all these problems which is why heaven, these physical problems don't exist. They don't exist. Why? We can imagine people, <coughs> if people, if we can imagine hearing some conversations in heaven where a person might say, you know, when I was on earth, I had pancreatic cancer. But, but I don't now because the Lord Jesus destroyed the pancreatic cancer work of the devil. I had, I had diabetes on her. Oh, someone's come, John, you would say. I had diabetes on her, but I don't have diabetes now because the Lord Jesus, he destroyed the diabetes work of the devil. And, 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 and in the end, everyone would just say, I, I died when I was on earth, but I won't ever die again because the Lord Jesus described, just destroyed the death work of the devil. See, all those works of the devil were destroyed by the Lord Jesus. He came to do that. And seeing all these people with all these physical problems in verse 30 come to the Lord, it illustrates how he alone is the answer to all the problems. And, and, and yet each person is, 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 is being brought to the Lord in this scene here in verse 30. They know very well what their individual problems are. They're not coming to be entertained by him. They're not coming to because they're curious as to who he was and what he can do. They're coming because they each had a physical problem and they wanted to be healed. And their friends wanted them to be healed and that's what they brought up. And the picture of those people coming with all their physical needs, it gives us a picture of who really benefits by coming to Christ. Just as those people with those specific problems, he came for the specific needs, so it is today. When a person who knows the needs of their soul, they're the ones who come and benefit from coming to Christ. This one's coming to Christ because he feels so defiled and dirty inside from sin, and, and so Christ cleanses his heart. 
And this one's coming to Christ because he feels so lonely and so abandoned and needs a real friend. And so Christ becomes his, his friend, his presence in his life. This one's coming to Christ because he has panic attacks. And he and 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 and, and, the, and problems just seem to overwhelm him to the point where he can't even breathe. And he comes to Christ and he re, and Christ gives him the protection and the assurance from his fears. All coming with specific needs and, and, and receiving re, and with specific requests and receiving specific help. Those are the ones who benefit from Christ. And in verse 30, we, we see that when, when they reach the Lord Jesus Christ, it says in verse 30, they cast them down, the people, at Jesus' feet, and he healed them all. So when they brought their disabled, they didn't come with a detailed list of, uh, you know, uh, 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 Jesus, this person uh, developed this problem at this time in his life, and it's gotten worse over time, and, 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 and now he's not able to, blah, blah, blah. But they, they just they just cast him down. They cast him down at the feet of Jesus. Very interesting. They cast him down at the feet of Jesus because they're making a statement. They're not saying anything, but when they cast him down at the feet of Jesus, they're saying a lot because they're making a statement of we have complete trust. We have complete dependence on you. We know we know you know all about this. We don't have to give you a, a big a big physical history here. There, there's nothing need to be said. All we do we cast him. We're, we're and cast the feet, cast the feet means we don't have any rights. We're not standing, in front of, he's not standing or sitting. We have no rights, or no demands, no claims for this healing. The, the, at your feet, totally your decision, Lord. And no words spoken. Just cast down at Jesus' feet, and yet it speaks volumes. The presentation of the need before the Lord, very similar to Hezekiah. Hezekiah, when Hezekiah was faced with a very, very disturbing and frustrating letter from, from, uh, from, from the Assyrians who were about to totally destroy Jerusalem and had it under siege, and he gets this letter, and everything in the letter is true about how, how, how the Assyrians had conquered all these people, and, and, and what is Hezekiah going to do? He's going to go up there and he's gonna, it's just going to talk endlessly before the Lord. He Lord, do you understand? He doesn't. He, Isaiah 37, 14. Isaiah 37, 14. Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed unto the Lord and said, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, that dwells between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Incline thine ear, O Lord, and hear. Open thine eyes, O Lord, see. Hear all the words of Sennacherib, which he hath sent to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the king of Assyria, they have laid waste all the nations in their countries. They have cast their gods into the fire. They were no gods, but the work of man's hands, wood and stone. Therefore have they destroyed them. Now, therefore, O Lord our God, save us from his hand, that all the kings of the earth may know that thou art the Lord, even thou art. It was a catastrophe for Israel and for Hezekiah. They're in a siege. They're starving. The Assyrians and Hezekiah, he, he receives this letter of condemnation from the, from the Assyrians. And, and the letter's true. And he gets it. And, and he just, just spreads it out before God. Cast it at his feet. Cast it at his feet. Just like what we're seeing here in verse 30. Just like, just like the friends of that crippled man who... who who took the tiles off the roof. We don't read they said anything. They just lowered him down to be in front of Jesus in Mark 2.2. Mark 2.2. Straight away, many of them were gathered together in so much they no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. He preached the word unto them. They come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. When they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof. Where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed where the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven. So, Lord, of all these, 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 these sick people, they're, they're laying there at his feet. And he sees the faith of the people who brought them there, and he heals them. And the sick were healed. And then it says something that happened. To the multitude, not the sick now, but to the ones who brought him. In verse 31, verse 31, insomuch that the multitude wondered 
when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to be made whole, the lame to walk, the blind to see, and they glorified the God of Israel. You know that word is interesting there? They wondered. It says they, the, the multitude wondered. It's a Greek word that means they admired. They admired. When they saw this healing, they admired the healer. And, 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 and then it says something that maybe you look at and you say, well, that's a little bit out of place. I don't get that. They glorified the God of Israel. What do you mean they glorified the God of Israel? That's the Old Testament. No, that, that means that when they saw the Lord Jesus heal, that at that moment, they knew who they were looking at. They were looking at the God of Israel. And the crowd of the Jewish people were like the rep, rep, they were like representing in seed form the nation of Israel, admiring Jesus and knowing that they're admiring the God of Israel. And it's like a prophetic scene there, a little prophetic scene. It's because today, Jesus for the nation of Israel is described in Isaiah 49.7. Isaiah 49.7, thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, to him whom man despiseth, to him whom the nation abhorreth, to a servant of rulers. Kings shall see and arise, princes shall also worship, because the Lord is faithful. And the Holy One of Israel, he shall choose thee. See, this is God the Father. This is the Holy Spirit addressing the Lord Jesus, and as two of the Godhead are, are addressing this other person, the Godhead, the, the Lord Jesus, and they identify him in Isaiah 49, 9, 49, 7, 49, 7. Oh, you are him whom the whom man despises. We're calling him that. That's how he's described. Who man dis despises. He's described, he's described there like he is described in Isaiah 53.3. Isaiah 53.3. He's despised and rejected of men. He's a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Israel speaking. We hid, as it were, our face from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Not once, but twice in Isaiah 53.3, he is described as despised. And that's the response of the natural man to Jesus Christ. There, there's, just, there's just no other explanation to why his name, Jesus Christ, or Jesus, somebody recently, uh, I, I, I told somebody shocking, and he, and he, and he said, oh, Jesus, Jesus, he says. Why would he do that? Why didn't he say Buddha? Why, why didn't he say Allah? Why didn't he say Joseph Smith? But because the name, why is the name of Jesus used like that? Because Isaiah 53, 3, because he's despised. He, 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 he's re, he, he was despised. See, that verse says the present, Isaiah 53, 3 says, he is despised. And then the end of that verse says, he was despised in the past. He is despised today. He was despised in the past. Because it's an old hatred. It's an old despising. Like, like the old hatred that the Palestinians have against the Jewish people. Because the word Palestinian comes from the word Philistine. Philistine and Palestinian. Palestinian is the same. And, and, and God has a comment about the Philistines. In, in Ezekiel 25.15, Ezekiel 25.15, Thus saith the Lord God, because the Philistines have dealt by revenge and have taken vengeance with a despiteful heart to destroy it for the old hatred. The old hatred. You, you might as well put that in there. Because the Palestinians have dealt by revenge and have taken vengeance with a despiteful heart to destroy it for the old hatred. So the Lord Jesus, he's not only called in Isaiah 49, 7, him whom man despises, he's also called in Isaiah 49, 7, him whom the nation abhorreth. A nation abhorreth. I mean, I was speaking to a, a, a person in the Jewish agency in, in Jerusalem about my application to become an Israeli citizen, and, and uh, questions were going on. But when I said, I believe in Jesus, I tell you, it was like fire shot through that phone receiver. And, 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 and when, the, when she said to me, well, citizenship is just not available for you. Why? Because Jesus is, Isaiah 49, 7, the, him whom the nation, nation of Israel, abhorreth. Well, the wonderful part about verse 31 is that it's not going to be forever and that this is really uh, when it says they admired or wondered him, wondered at him, and that verse, the nation of Israel, can be seen in the future. 
it, 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 no longer despising, no longer hating Jesus, but admiring him, worshiping him, and kept, and, 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 and they were there at his feet, depending on him. And that's why verse 30 is so important when it says, they glorified the God of Israel. When we read that, and we attempted to say, what's the God of Israel got to have anything to do with this, this scene? The answer is that they knew at that time they were admiring the Lord Jesus. They were admiring the God of Israel. Prophetic, prophetic picture of what will happen after the super holocaust. Super holocaust. The Nazis, Hitler, that was the holocaust. But the super holocaust is described in the book of, of Zechariah, Zechariah 13.9, Zechariah 13.9, where it says, I will bring the third part through the fire. Where we find them as silver as we find, and we'll try them as gold as tried, and they shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, It's my people. They shall say, The Lord is my God. See, when that verse says that the third part through the fire, that means that the, the two parts didn't make it, they didn't survive. That's the verse before Ezekiel 13 8. Ezekiel 13 8. It shall come to pass that all the land saith the Lord, Two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third part shall be left therein. That's why the Holocaust, that's why I just say the Holocaust, the Holocaust here in Isaiah 13, 8 through 9, that's a super Holocaust. You know what I mean? Hitler killed one third. This is describing twice, two thirds. But the one third who survived and are brought through the fire by God, that's a fire of purification. That's a fire of purification described in Ezekiel 20, verse 38. Ezekiel 20, verse 38, when God says, I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. And I'll bring them forth out of the country, and they shall not enter into the land of Israel. You shall know that I am the Lord. This purification is described in one of the last verses in the Old Testament before the 400-year silence in, in Malachi 3.3. Malachi 3.3. He shall, God, he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, that they may offer, that they may, they, they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. And so what happens after this purification? What happens after this purging? Zechariah 13, 9 happens. I'll bring them the third part through the fire, refine them as silver as refined, try them as gold as tried. They shall call on my name. What name might that might, might that be? The name they despise. Them. Jesus, they shall call on my name, I will hear them, and I'll say, is my people, and they'll say, the Lord is my God. That's the God of Israel. And this purification of Jewish people as a whole, and, and, it, and, and it, 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 it all, while they're looking at him, and they're saying, Ezekiel 13, 9, the Lord is my God. In other words, they're going to do what it says the end of verse 31. They glorified the God of Israel. They admired him. He's the God of Israel. It's a little bit, a little prophetic picture here of what's coming from the nation of Israel. And then God's going to say, it's my people. And long last, you know how long God's been longing to say about Israel, Ami, my people. At long last, he's going to stop saying, Lo Ami, not my people. Oh, Hosea 1 9, Hosea 1 9. Then said God, call his name Lo Ami. For you are not my people, and I will not be your God. But it's all going to change with it, from Jesus being despised, Jesus being rejected, Jesus being abhorred, abhorred, to Jesus being admired, and Jesus being seen as the God of Israel. And that's what we have here in verse 31. Verse 31. Little taste of the good things to come, as it says in Hebrews 9.11. Hebrews 9.11. Christ being come a high priest of good things to come. Now, now that the Lord has looked at the ill and he's and been cast at his feet and he's healed them, and, and he now changes his focus from the ill to those who brought the ill in verse 32. Jesus called his disciples and said unto them, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat, and I will not send them away fasting lest they faint away. So his heart was broken for the ill, and he, he healed them. Now his heart feels a hunger and this feeling of being famished for the crowd that brought them. 
And, and we learn from 30, verse 32 that this event of, of healing and so forth, this, this stretched over three days. This was not just one day. This was three days. So the, the crowd has been coming and they've been bringing the ill to everybody to get healed there. And it's been a three-year period. And the Lord didn't say after the first day, sorry, my time's up. i got to go. He just stayed and stayed and stayed. And with each ill per or person there gets healed, that, that, they, 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 they don't go home. They stand and say, well, well we, we, we got what we came for, but let, they, they didn't say that. They didn't say, well, let's go home. we, we got to get something to eat. We're hungry. we got to leave here. No. Everyone is so admiring, so amazed at, at the Lord Jesus and what he's doing there. They just say, let, let, let's stay. We'll, we'll eat sometime later. Uh, let's watch every person get healed here. And so the three days go on, and they just keep admiring him and admiring him. They forget about food. The Lord is, and the Lord is now, he hasn't forgotten about their food. He's feeling their hunger. And so he says in verse 32, I have compassion on the multitude. He meant, I'm feeling their hunger. And, and the Lord says that, and then he says, I will not send them away fasting. And that meant that the people were going to be fed. How? Nobody knew. None of the disciples knew how the multitude was going to be fed. They, no, they, but he said, I will not send them away fasting. When he said that, I will not, that was a guarantee that people were going to be fed. It was just like when that leper came to the Lord in, in Matthew 8, 2. Matthew 8, 2. Behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth the hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. The leper didn't say to the Lord, Now, Lord, uh, if you can just put your hand on me, then I'll be healed. He didn't say something like the woman said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. He didn't do that. The leper got right to the heart of the matter when he said, all I need is for you to want to. If you want to, I will be. And it was that faith in the power of the Lord that the leper had to see that all the leper needed was the Lord to want to, that he'd be healed. And that's what the Lord said. All right. That's the way you look at it. I will. That's what he said. And he was, then the rest was history. History with the hand and how he was touched. So the problem is that the disciples, they didn't have that kind of faith like the, like the leper had there. They didn't realize that when the Lord said in verse 32, I will not send them away fasting, that they had their guarantee. They had their guarantee that the, there'd be enough bread. How? No. Not sure. But it's going to happen. So the disciples, they were caught up with the how. Well, how's this going to, I don't know, where's the bread that kind of come from? I don't see any bakeries. They're just caught up with that. And so in verse 33, his disciples say to him, when should we have so much bread in the wilderness to fill so great a multitude? You know, it's like they were saying, have you taken account of how many there are out there? There's a huge crowd out there. and They're all worried and frowning and frustrated. You know, they're caught up in that. And, and they look around on the mountain and this and, and, and they look up in the sky and you know, do you guys see any man up there? No, I don't see any man. Yeah, no words gonna come. And you can feel the anxiety of the disciples and how they're trying to come up with ways how we're gonna do this. Where's it gonna come from? And they're wasting a lot of worry power over something that, that's already in the bag. But they just can't see the back. And that's what we do. We worry and we get anxious and we get worked up all over things that God's already got it under control. It's, it's solved. All we need is the assurance of his will, like the left. Like these people. Like like he told them that there. I'm not gonna send them away. I will not send them away faster. We're gonna back to the disciples after. The multitude was fed, and they look back over the history and they say, "Why did it get so? Why did, why did we get so worked up over that? And how, over how those people were going to get fed? Why didn't we just rely on His word? He said He's not going to send them away fasting. That's enough. And that's what happens with us. And so the Lord does uh, not. He does something very interesting here." He says they're not going to send them away fasting. So 
maybe he could have made the ground to sprout bread right next to everybody. A loaf of bread would just pop up. Oh, wait, oh, that's great. Hot out the dirt oven. <laughs> well, you know, he'd done this for 40 years in the, in, the, in, uh, in, in the wilderness. Why not just like, you know, here it comes, grab it, you know, manna from heaven. But he didn't do those things. And it's interesting, in verse 34, instead, he saith then to them, how many loaves have you? And they said seven and a few little fishes. Why did he want to know how many loaves there were? What difference does it make? He's going to make many, many loaves. But he wanted them to focus on what they had. How many have you got? Hey, boys, I don't need to know how many uh, people there are out there. I just want to know how many loaves you've got. Can you do a count for me, please? I said, okay, we count over. So the Lord here has decided to use this bread and the fish that they had. Now, that's kind of an interesting scene because we can imagine the disciples taking this inventory. How many bread you got? How many you got? How many you got? All the bread and the fish that they have. And then they're being asked by the Lord, we'll hand it over. That's all I got. And we can see how the Lord, he wants to use what they have to meet the needs of others. And we can imagine the, the disciples, they were saying to themselves, it's their problem if they didn't bring food. This is my food. I wasn't dumb. I brought food. I got, this is my bread. These are my fishes, fish here. And, and you're asking me to give all the food I have up right now. And, 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 and they, they, they might, you can imagine them saying, wait a minute, that's our food. You're going to take our food to give it to others? What are we going to have? What's going to be our food? And, but the disciples, they hand it over. They hand it, he wants the bread, the fishes, give them the bread, the fishes. Just like Mary, his mother, said. They have no wine. Whatever he tells you to do, just do it. Don't look to me. I don't know what's going to happen. He wants you to fill the water pots. Fill the water pots. He wants the bread. Take the bread. So they hand it all over. But as they hand it over, they're handing it over with a hand of trust. I, I don't know how this nothing amount of bread is going to feed others or us because we're giving it to you. But we trust you. We know you're going to take care. It's a picture there of how the Lord asks us to give what we have and, 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 and not be concerned about what we're giving up because, because God's going to take care of them and us also. And so he's got the bread now and now he addresses the group in verse 35. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. So the Lord commands the group to sit down and he's asking the group, just trust me just sit down and wait. Just like the Lord said to, 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 to the Jewish people, to Israel, when they thought they were on their last day on earth. And, and they watched the, the Egyptians coming in their chariots, and they looked at each other and said, won't be long now, boys, before we feel cold Egyptian steel on our necks cutting our heads off. We're going to be beheaded here by these Egyptian chariots, the drivers and all of them. And, 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 and Moses says to them, when they're in that state, in Exodus 14, 13, Exodus 14, 14, 13, Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again, no more, forever. So the command to stand still is like the command to sit down it's a command, don't do anything more. The bread and the fish, the little fish is here. They've been given to the Lord, and now you're going to see something fabulous. And just like Ruth was told by Naomi, sit and wait when Ruth was, you know, will he marry me? Will he marry me now? Will he marry me? Above yeah, Boaz. <laughs> and, and so Naomi told, tells Ruth in Ruth 3.18, through Ruth 3.18, then said she, sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall. For the man will not be in rest until he have finished this thing this day. Sit, stand, are commands to don't be anxious about what God's going to do. Just know that God will do. And, and so the Lord takes the, the loaves and the fishes, 
It says in verse 36, verse 30, verse 36. He took the seven loaves, the fishes, he gave thanks, he break them, he gave to his disciples, disciples to the multitude. It's kind of interesting there. When he takes them, you know, you don't hear him pray, oh God, this is so little, what are we going to do here? <laughs> he gives thanks. It kind of, maybe he, he would have said something like, you know, little as much if God is in it. This is going to be so exciting to see what you're going to do with this little amount here. You're going to provide. This, this is going to be amazing. It reminds me of the, 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 the Nichols case when we were in court. And uh, uh, I, previous to that, I'd gone around the country and I, I'd said that Quest Laboratory was, was, was killing patients. They didn't quite appreciate that. And they said, we're, we're, we're going to kill you. I mean, in court, the company. And um, so, you know, we go to the court and, and, and they sued us for patent infringement. And, uh, and uh, uh, I met with one of the vice presidents of, of Quest who said something like, we've already printed your funeral announcements. You're gone as a company. Well, we went to the, the in, in, we were in Takati, we, we were building uh, a building there, and, and we had made a commitment for $8 million, and we were planning on borrowing $7 million from the bank. You know, we had a million dollars. We were in business for tw 25 years. We had a million dollars to show for it. We needed $7 million to go to the bank. We go to the lawyers and say, how much is it going to cost us to defend ourselves? They said, about two to three million. It turned out to be eight million. Whoa. So we were like $15 million short. We've been in business for, for 25 years. We had a million dollars. And we and we needed 15 million. So, you know, we, we thought we gotta we gotta wait 15 times 25 <laughs> years to get the this amount. So and then, for five years, when we're uh, down in the, the Schwartz building there in the federal court here, and this, defending ourselves in this patent case, we're down there all the time for five years, you know, totally occupied. Nobody's buying at the shop, you know. And and uh, and we needed uh, we needed uh, we needed fifteen million dollars, and nobody's minding the shop. And during that five-year period, the Lord Jesus Christ rained profits on us. We got fifteen million dollars wow. in profits. That was incredible. That was. Lord, what are you, how are you gonna how are you gonna take these seven loaves and these few fishes here and feed this multitude? How are you gonna take this million dollars that we gotta pay it anyway? For how are you gonna cover all our bills with that? And and God says, God says, watch me. Sit still. Sit down. Stand still. And the results are, are verse 37. Results of verse 37. They did all eat and were filled. And they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets full. And they that did eat were 4,000 men, besides women and children. And he sent the multitude away, took sheep, ship, and came into the coast of Magdala. Now we get into, now we get into some numerical figures here. First one is the, the figure all. They did all eat. And, and then the next detail was they were full. You know, it wasn't like a little piece for you. Don't ask for anything more. It wasn't Oliver's. Please, sir, may I have some more? More? Yeah, take more. You know, you want more, take more. And and and, and then the detail comes up of uh, there's there's leftovers. Anybody here want seconds, thirds, fourths? There's leftovers. Seven baskets full. We get the detail. Seven baskets full. And well, how many were there? Four thousand men, not counting the women and the children. Four thousand men were fed from seven loaves and a few fishes. That's amazing. That's God. That's God. That shows what happens when he says, I will not send them away uh, hungry. And, and when what, is, what, what they had, all that they had was given to him. That shows what happens. That shows what happens. And he sent them away. And no one said, I didn't get any. No one said, they were all fed so much. You can have something to take home. That's the way God works. Father, thank you so much for being an admirable God of Israel.